Okay, well, let's get started. My name is Lauren Scott, and this is Lo Lauren Rosenshine Bennett. And we're happy to be here to talk about something that we really enjoy talking about, and that's uh, spatial statistics and analysis. Um, we ask that, let me see. What we're going to do today is a little bit different. We kind of have fun with this last workshop. It's an opportunity for us to go into more details than we do in some of our, in our other workshops. So this workshop does kind of build on the spatial pattern analysis workshop and the regression analysis workshop. But if you miss those either or both of those, um, it's not a problem. Please, we don't want you to go. But just realize that some things might feel to you like we're covering them just a little bit quickly. We're going to review them, but we're not going to go into a lot of depth because we're thinking that many of you probably already took those other ones. Um, we do something funny as we pretend that Lauren here is a brand new GIS analyst, that she has actually attended the two workshops. So she's, you know, learned some of the things that you have as well. And she's been tasked with solving a real world problem. So the context for her analysis today The context for analysis is that we have this community that's spending a large portion of public resources responding to 911 emergency calls. In addition, their projections are telling them that their community is almost going to double in size over the next 10 years. So they have some concerns. They have some questions. Um, they have questions like, can we be any more efficient in the layout of our police and fire stations that respond to 911 calls? How effective are those locations? Can we, uh, we know that some areas in our communities uh, get lots of calls, others not so many. What are the factors that contribute to high numbers of 911 calls, the high call volumes? And is there anything that we can do to try to reduce the numbers of calls that we get? And given that we understand that population growth is coming, what kind of call volumes can we expect in the future? So this is going to be Lauren's task today, and the data that she's working with actually is real data from the Portland, Oregon area. Um, let's see how this goes. So Lauren, one of the things that this community is interested in is evaluating the existing locations of their um, fire and police stations. Um, one strategy that you might want to try would be to run a hotspot analysis on their 911 call data. Um, to see where they're getting lots of calls. And then maybe you can compare that to the fire and the police uh, units that would respond to that. Now the way, if you remember from the workshop yesterday, that the way hotspot analysis works is it looks at each feature within the context of neighboring features. And it's looking for statistically significant spatial clusters of high values and statistically significant clusters of low values, the cold spots and the hot spots. It then it computes a z-score and a p-value for every one of those features uh, to tell you if the clustering it finds is statistically significant or not. Um, so this is going to be a fun analysis. <laughs> but there's a couple things that you're going to need to watch out for. So we know that um, hotspot analysis needs a, an analysis variable. It needs a variable to analyze. Um, so the first thing that you're going to have to figure out is what is your analysis field going to be? Because we have 911 data, each incident is just one feature. There's not really an attribute that you can use for this. So you're going to have to um, figure out a way to come up with a count or a rate for those 911 incident calls. And a couple of the tools that might help you out there, the integrate tool, the collect events tool. Then the hotspot analysis tool is also going to ask you to provide a distance, which represents your scale of analysis. And a tool that's going to help you with that is incremental spatial order correlation. So why don't you give it a go? OK. So here's my data. 911 calls in an area outside of Portland, Oregon. And like Lauren said, I need to run a hotspot analysis because I want to understand the patterns in the data. I want to find those statistically significant clusters so we can see if these um, response stations are in good locations, if, if the locations make sense based on kind of the patterns that we're seeing in the data. And rather than looking at just points on a map, we want to take it a step further and, and do a hotspot analysis. So that's what we're going to do. So we'll start by running a hotspot analysis, which is in the mapping clusters tool set in the spatial stats toolbox. And we'll open it up. 
and we'll point to our data. And notice that the second parameter that we have to fill in is this input field. But I've got point data, incident data, and that incident data doesn't have a value associated with it. So what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to start by doing something kind of crazy. <laughs> I'm going to uh, look at the help. <laughs> it's a really crazy idea, but unbelievably, the help is sometimes actually quite helpful, um, including one of the usage tips here where I see in bold that we have a little note about the input field, which tells me that it should contain a variety of values and that if I want to use the tool to analyze the spatial pattern of incident data, I should consider aggregating my incident data. So I click on this link, and it brings me to a whole little section about ways to think about aggregating my incident data, right? So one, uh, one really good option is to go to a set of kind of existing geographies or polygons. Um, and I can use the spatial join tool to do that, to get a count in each of the polygons. Another good option, especially if there, there really isn't a, a meaningful set of polygons in your particular study area, creating a, a fishnet is a good idea, to, to, and then doing the spatial join um, to that fishnet. And then the third option is the option that Lauren mentioned in her slides before we got started, is the integrate and collect events method. So essentially what that does is it starts by first snapping features that are within a specified distance together, and then, it creates, and then it creates a new feature class that has the count of how many features are in each unique location. So um, that's, that, that's the option we're going to choose because, well, I trust Lauren pretty implicitly. So and then there's even some pictures about um, what, what those methods kind of look like. So going back here, we're not ready to run our hotspot analysis. So I'm going to close that for now and start by running the integrate tool, which I will search for because I don't remember what toolbox it's in, and searching is awesome. Oh, I'm searching ArcGIS Online, of course. Come on. So we've got the integrate tool. So the first tool I'm going to run if you write down one single thing the entire time you're in here today, it is this. You might notice that integrate does not have an output feature class. That's because there is no output feature class. Integrate actually changes your input data. I repeat. Integrate actually changes your input data. So please, if you care at all about your input data, your original data, please start by making a copy of your original data. I now absolve myself of all responsibility. Okay? I don't want to get any nasty emails that you didn't remember to. You can send me a commiserating email. I will definitely feel bad for you and commiserate because I have made the mistake myself, but making a copy is very important. So I'm going to use the copy of the 911 call data that I've already made. And then we have to pick an XY tolerance. And the way that we think about this is um, I had a great conversation, I think, two years ago at the user conference with a crime analyst. Um, and we were talking, he was saying, you know, we've got the data is being collected out in the field by um, officers, and let's say we have seven crimes, and they all happened in the 7-Eleven parking lot. But because of the way that they were collected, they all are in slightly different locations, right? They, they're not showing as one single unique location. And so this is kind of where we're going to take that accurate, the, the kind of accuracy in our data into consideration. And we're going to say, OK, if they're within, let's say, 30 feet of each other in this case, we want them to snap so that they have the exact same location. Let's say you didn't have that problem and you really did have true um, lots of co already that points that are already truly coincident. Then you could just skip right to collect events because collect events finds points that are truly coincident and adds them up. But if they're not truly coincident, integrates a good way to get them there so that they are in that same location. So we'll run that analysis. And then we will run collect events, which is actually also in the spatial stats toolbox, but I really love searching. 
So we'll point to our copy since that is now changed. And collect events is essentially just going to count up the number of coincident points, right? And it's going to return to us the, those coincident points or the, that count as graduated symbols. So immediately we can see that now we have anywhere from 1 to 25 points in each of those locations. And that added that to our attribute table, right? So we have all that information. And now we're ready to run our hotspot analysis. So we'll go back in. We'll point to our collect events data. We'll use the count field. Then we have some more decisions to make. Fixed distance band in this case is a good option because we want to basically look at each feature within its neighbor, the neighboring features by, by this moving window. So the scale of analysis stays the same and each feature is being looked at um, in relation to a kind of a fixed neighborhood. So that's a good option. But what we, don't, what we still do have to decide is what that fixed distance is. What's the distance band that we're going to use? This is where we decide what the scale of our analysis is. And Lauren warned us that this was going to be a bit of a challenge or something we would at least need to think about, right? So I don't really know what a good distance band is for this data. There's no kind of logical thing that's coming to my mind that is directly related to the way that I want to solve the problem. So what I want to do is let the data show me a good scale for my analysis. And to do that, I'm going to use a new tool in 10.1 called incremental spatial autocorrelation. And for those of you who weren't here yesterday, um, just a little note that incremental spatial autocorrelation is um, a new tool in 10.1, but we originally released it as a sample script for ArcGIS 10. So if you have 10, you can get this, this tool as a sample script on our resources page, which we will point you to at the end. Alternatively, even if you have, if you're at, at 9.3, you could do this. You just run spatial autocorrelation multiple times at increasing distances, which is all the tool is doing. So, or you could practice a little Python and write one yourself, because <laughs> it's not so bad. <laughs> so we'll point to our collect events data. We fill it in just like uh, the hotspot analysis. We'll use our count field. The, in the, um, in 10.1, the, the defaults for the beginning and distance increments are, are really good. We chose, we chose well. And we'll create that report file. So what it's doing is it's going through and it's testing for the intensity of clustering at increasing distances. So it's going to see at the first distance, which it, we can see was about 3,500 feet. So at 3,500 feet, how intense is the clustering? And then it's going to see at almost 4,000 feet how intense is the clustering. And it's going to test the intensity. And what we're looking for are peaks in the intensity, distances at which the intensity of that clustering is really intense. So rather than looking at a bunch of numbers, we can go in and look at the output PDF, which gets created. In the 10.0 version, it actually creates a table and then uses the kind of out-of-the-box graphing to create that graph. But both of them do create a graph. And so what we're looking for are peaks. And we can see that there's actually multiple peaks here, which isn't unexpected. And actually, if we um, looked at the tool help, well, first of all, the, even just the, the sidebar image here is, gives us a pretty good understanding of what we're looking for and the idea that these, are, these different peaks represent different scales of our analysis and, and really answer different questions, right? So each of these are going to give us a different answer depending on kind of the, the kinds of clusters, the kinds of patterns that we're looking for. So in this case, we're really interested in the, the, the most local, the most neighborhood level um, clusters that we can find. And so that first distance, we find that often the first distance is, is a good one. So we'll use that first distance, which, was, which is about uh, 4,600 feet. So we'll run it with that, oh, we'll run it with that distance. And it's looking at each of those features within um, 4,600 feet. And it's returning to us the points, each of, those in, each of those unique locations, and whether or not they're part of a statistically significant hotspot or cold spot. 
So for me, as a GIS analyst, I'm okay with this output because I understand that each of those points was analyzed and each of those points has an associated z-score and a p-value that tell me if I have statistical significance in, um, if I have statistically significant hot spots or cold spots. But I know, and I know most of you are probably thinking the same thing, this is not what the decision makers in my organization are expecting to see when I tell them I'm going to show them a hot spot map, right? They don't want to see a bunch of color-coded points. They want to see a surface. This is what they see in the, the news and what they see in the newspapers, and so that's what they're expecting to see. And so as uh, in, in, in order, basically our analysis on, is only as useful as it is used, right? So this analysis is awesome, but if nobody can understand and interpret the results, it's not very useful. And so what we want to do is help the decision makers interpret the results. And since they're expecting a surface, well, we are going to give them one. <laughs> so the way that we have um, found that we get a, create a nice surface is using IDW, which is in um, the interpolation tool set. This is a spatial analyst tool. So the spatial stats tool is no extension. They're core in the software. Creating the surface, you do need spatial analysts to do that. We'll use IDW. We've found that IDW looks the nicest. And since the goal here is pure visualization, that's what we're gonna, that's what we're gonna use. So we'll point to the output of our hotspot analysis. The value that we're gonna use for the interpolation is gonna be our z-score. Except the defaults because they seem to do they seem to look okay, and that's our goal. Pretty picture, pretty much. And then we get the results. Of course, it does not look that nice because they don't know that we're interpolating a hotspot analysis, right? So we'll go in and we will update the symbology here. We'll do a red to blue. Looks pretty good. Maybe give it a little bit of transparency. So now we have this surface that pretty much represents um, the results of our hotspot analysis. One thing that we really want to stress is that it's really important, and as much as you can, keep the points on, because that's the true results of the hotspot analysis, right? So we have the true results, our statistical significance associated with those points, and then we have a visualization tool to help us interpret those points. So keeping them both on, you kind of cover, cover your bum. Right? You have the valid statistical output, you have the surface that the decision makers are expecting, and, and everybody's happy. Um, and so then we can actually do what we really wanted to do, which is look at how this relates to something like our response stations and where those are located. And so we can immediately see that clearly this one's in a great location in the middle of the hot spot. This one seems to, you know, be well located near this, this kind of smaller hot spot. And we can't certainly say that this one is in a horrible location. It may very well need to be there so that citizens are, are being serviced in a certain amount of time. But if we were to recommend one to look into to say, is there a better place we could locate this where we could still be serving the population well, but maybe be closer to some of the hotspot areas, this might be the one that we would recommend. So we start to see the pattern, we understand, and we have a, 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 an output that decision makers can use to really understand the results of our analysis. So I, I, I did a pretty good job, right? Yes, you did. <laughs> nice job, Lauren. Before we go back to the slides, though, let's think about the next analysis that we're going to do. Um, I know whenever I look at a hotspot map, and I know it's the same with you too, Lauren, I immediately start thinking, what the heck is going on? You know, why do we see so many 911 calls in that area? Why are there so much fewer in another area? And whenever you see a hotspot map, it seems to make you ask why questions. What do you think it might be? Why do you think we might be getting so many hotspots in some areas and not so many in others? Does anybody have... Population, right? Yeah, if we don't have any people, we're probably not gonna get very many 911 calls. And that was our guess as well. Could be other factors as well, but we were wondering, I wonder if we're just seeing a map, a hotspot map of population. If we made a hotspot map of population, would it look just like this one? Okay. Slides. So notice here that we're starting to ask why questions. And from the Modeling Spatial Relationships workshop yesterday, um, 
Lauren knows that regression analysis is all about answering this kind of why questions. Why are we seeing so many 911 calls where, where we're seeing them? Um, and in fact, this is one of the questions that our community is also very interested in answering. Regression analysis works by modeling a dependent variable. In this case, we want to model 911 call volumes as a function of other variables, explanatory variables that we think are going to be important predictors of the number of 911 calls that we're going to get. And as you know, Lauren, um, the most difficult part of any kind of regression analysis is finding that complete set, finding all of the key explanatory variables that are important to what you're trying to model. And unfortunately, until you find all those key explanatory variables, you really can't fully trust the results of your model. If you do have trouble finding, so you're going to build a regression model. And if you do to try to explain calls as a function of other variables like population or income or education levels, and if you have trouble finding a properly specified model, one of the tools that you can try is exploratory regression. And we talked a little bit about exploratory regression yesterday. Um, you know you have a good model. We went through the checks yesterday in the workshop, but we're going to go really quickly through them again. You know you have a good model when the explanatory variables that you're using are statistically significant, when you know that they are actually helping your model and that the signs of the coefficients, the relationships that are being represented, are what you expect. You also want to make sure a good, a good properly specified model has variables that are getting at different aspects of whatever you're trying to model. So you're going to want to check to make sure that none of those variables are redundant. If you have two variables that are telling the same story, it leads to an overcount type of bias. So you're going to check the variance inflation factor, making sure that, that all of those values are less than about 7.5. Another really important check is to make sure that your model under and over predictions aren't clustered. Um, they should reflect random noise. When you have a properly specified uh, model, the, the, you over predict a little bit here, you under predict a little bit there, but the under and over predictions are really um, just random noise. If you have clustering, if you see one area where all of the over predictions cluster and all the under predictions cluster somewhere else, it means you're, you're missing a key explanatory variable and you can't trust, completely trust your model. So you need to identify what are maybe some other variables that can help you out there. You also want to check the hark bayer test. Um, this diagnostic makes sure that the under and over predictions are normally distributed. And what the reason that's important is because if they're not, the hark bayer test is statistically significant. That's not a good thing. That means your model's biased. Either your model is predicting really well in some areas, but not so well in others. Or maybe your model's predicting real well for those places that don't have very many 911 calls, but not doing a great job for those places that have lots of them. So you want to make sure that the hark bear test is not statistically significant. And last, you want to make sure you have a good model. So you're looking for the large adjusted R squared values and small Aikiki. Akiaki. Akiaki. <laughs> or Aikiki information criteria, the AICC value. We know for sure it's AICC. Yeah, it's the, after that, it's not, it's not sure. If you do decide that you want to use exploratory regression to find a properly specified model, you're going to need to realize that there really is a trade-off. You're going to learn the, what the exploratory regression is going to try every possible combination of potentially very long list of candidate explanatory variables. And you're going to learn so much about your data and about the relationships in those variables. Um, even if you don't find a properly specified model, you're going to learn a lot about correlations. But you do need to realize that you're going to increase your risk for committing a type 1 error, which means you might say, ooh, I found something when you really didn't. You also increase your risk of finding a, a model that's overfit. So in order to avoid that, you're going to want to make sure that you select variables that are supported by common sense and by theory and that you think really are so, uh, related to what you're trying to model. Um, and you're also going to want to eventually, before you report back to the client, validate the results of your model. So we have data that's actually a couple years old. We can validate this model using more recent um, data before we report to the client. Okay, so why don't you see if you can find a properly specified model for our community. Well, this is going to be fun. So before we can do our regression analysis, um, because we have 
even for instance population. We know population is going to be important, right? So we have that data in um, in census tracts, and so that's actually what we're going to do. We're going to move from the point level data into polygons, where we have counts of each um, within each. These are census tracts, right? Yeah. Or are they? They might be blocks. I don't. Know. Oh, there may no longer be a GOID. We tried to clean it up, you know? It's pretty. The FIPS isn't there anymore? No. Well, the polygons, they have population. I think they They have all sorts of data, it's census data. Um, and what we're, trying to what we're trying to understand in this case is the number of 911 calls in each of these polygons, right? So I think maybe it's just population. I'm going to go with that because it's one variable. It sounds easy. Let's just try, right? Why not? What do we have to lose? It's easy enough to test that hypothesis. All we're going to do is run OLS using our 911 call data, using the, the number of calls as our dependent variable and the population are, as our explanatory variable. And we're just going to run it. And when we do, it gives us a, a, a lot of output here. We talked a lot about this output yesterday. Um, first of all, we can see our R squared that Lauren mentioned. It's 0.39, probably not as high as we need it to be if we want to understand the impact of, let's say, a population increase in, in, in the future like, like they're expecting. So even the adjusted R squared, the performance isn't necessarily as good as, as we would want. So population, only using population only tells 39% of the... 39% of the call volume story. It's not very much, is it? We thought it would be more. Did we not think it would be higher? Yeah. I did. Yes, I did too. I did too. <laughs> so another one of those checks is spatial autocorrelation, right? And the output, these residuals, the, the map that we get is a map of those over and under predictions. And like Lauren said, unfortunately, we don't want there to be clustering. And I will run spatial autocorrelation, but I don't think I really need to on this one, do I? Does it this, look like the, the red and the blue are clustering? I mean, I, I don't know if I've ever seen residuals this badly clustered before. <laughs> but we'll test anyway, and we'll run a test for spatial autocorrelation on those residuals. Generate that report. Pretty sure we're going to have a, yeah, p-value of 0 0.00000000. There's a very small chance this pattern happened randomly, right? And we can look at the report and see that that is um, exactly what the report tells us. There's a less than 1% uh, chance that this clustered pattern could be the result of random chance, which means, unfortunately, that we have statistically significant spatial autocorrelation, clustering of our residuals, and we can't trust our model, which means that we need to find other variables, right? So we have lots of ideas. What kinds of variables might we want to include? Income might be a good one. Age might be a good one. Type of crime, that would be interesting, or type of incident. Time of day could be interesting. Zoning would be a very interesting one, yep. Unemployment, sure, yeah. So long list, right? We could come up with, I could come up with right now 100 variables I want to test. But we're not going to try 100 variables. We'll just try a couple, see what we can find. And we'll, to do this, thank goodness, we have exploratory regression. It makes our lives pretty easy. And what we're going to do is run exploratory regression using calls as our dependent variable and using everything else as our explanatory variables, right? except for the unique ID, the object ID, and we probably don't want to predict the number of 911 calls using the number of 911 calls. So I will leave that one out. But we've got things on population, education, unemployment, um, alcohol expenditure, income, education, all sorts of variables in here. And all I'm going to do is click go, and it's going to run through. Oh, I didn't create a text file. It's going to go through, and it's going to... Um, uh, test all the different combinations of those variables. And we're starting to see that we are getting a higher R squared, right? Using those, those new variables, we've gotten up to 0 0.8, 0 0.79, but Lauren was very clear that it is not enough to look at R squared, right? And 
because exploratory regression checks those six things for us, I don't have to do it. I know right away, because there's nothing listed in this passing models group, there's nothing here, we don't have any passing models, which is a real bummer and may happen. I can promise you. It, it, chances are you will at one point or another run this tool and find no passing models. But it's not the end of the world. It's, we, we still have a lot of techniques that we can use to try to find a passing model. So of course one of the things is we can look at this summary of what we, what, why don't we have any passing models, right? Which is I think one of the best things about this tool. So we don't have any, why? We passed, we had plenty, 83% of them passed the minimum adjusted R squared criteria, which the default is uh, 0.5. 8% um, of them have, have our models that have all of the variables are significant. 80% of them have no multicollinearity. 10% of them have no model bias. And zero have passed this, the test for spatial autocorrelation. So we know that our problem is spatial autocorrelation. So what do I want to do when I know my problem is spatial autocorrelation? I want to look at that spatial autocorrelation. That's one of the great things about using regression analysis in a GIS is that if there's clustering of the residuals, looking at that map of the residuals is a really good clue to see, oh, I'm, I'm really over predicting in this area. What's going on in this area? Why am I predicting higher than the true values. What could I be missing? What variable could help me explain that, right? So looking at the residual map is really, really valuable. So what I do, since we ran just now fi almost 5,000 um, different combinations, right? We did not create 5,000 residual maps. So the only way to create the residual map is I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick the highest adjusted R squared model and I'm going to run that in OLS to look at one of those residual maps. So this one has population, jobs, low education, median income, and median age. So let's go to OLS and run it with those five variables. Same dependent variable, then we're using population jobs, low education, median income, and median age. Those are our five variables that had the highest adjusted R squared in exploratory regression so that we can see those residuals. So we go through, we see the same um, diagnostics that we would have in exploratory regression because it's running the exact same analysis, OLS, in exploratory regression. Um, so we would see the same hark barra we would see the same Kernker, we would see the same R-squared. But we get a, a, a map now. We get that map of the residuals. So we're, start, we're seeing where we're, so the red areas are where the true values are higher than what we're predicting. So those are, what, those are under predictions, the red areas. So why are we under predicting in this area? What's going on? What could we do, what could we include that could help us deal with this spatial autocorrelation? So one of the things that we can do is just take a look at the context. You know, if I was from this area and, and really an analyst in this area, I probably would already know, right? I don't know. So I'm going to look at the underlying imagery and see if we can get any clues that way. Oh, I should probably turn everything else off first, though. So now we've got just our residuals and the underlying base map. And so what we're starting to see is there's a clear kind of difference in the type of, of land use, the type of area underneath those under predictions than the rest of the area. It looks to be kind of the more industrialized, the more urban part of this study area. So what we did, and what we probably should have done from the beginning, is created some spatial variables. In this case, we created a variable that's distance from the city center, distance from that urban area. And th those spatial variables we have found time and time and time again are the key to finding a properly specified model with this kind of spatial data. And so believe it or not, now we're what we're going to do is run this again, run exploratory regression again, except this time, hmm? I, yeah, so I created a var we've created a variable, I've got a different data set here that has the distance variable in it. And we're going to point to that choose the same dependent variable and this time, and we, cr we created that variable by just using the near tool. 
We just created a point and did a near from each one of those um, oh, census yeah. tracts or block groups to that, that point. So near is a, your best friend when you're doing this kind of analysis, near highways, near hospitals, near parks, near schools, uh, near fast food, the list goes on and on. So we use the near tool a lot. I use the near tool a lot. Um, get rid of the object ID and the unique ID. And we can see now that we have in here that distance to the urban center. And the only other thing I want to do is I want to change that minimum adjusted R squared because I happen to know that when I added that distance value, we're going to get a ton of passing models. And we don't want to um, look through all of them. So I will create the text file this time, give it a run. So now it's going through testing all those combinations. Still no passing models, but now we can see starting at, at models with four variables, we're starting to see models come up that are passing, right? That met all of the assumptions of OLS. So if I open up this results file here, we can see that we have a bunch of passing models. And so now we're faced with the horrible dilemma of having to pick between the lots of passing models that we have, which I say snidely because it's a great problem to have in my, when I was working on my thesis, it's a problem I would have paid a million dollars to have. <laughs> a million. <laughs> so we have a lot of very, we have a lot of models. And so the way that we really think about this is which of these, so of course we're looking at the, the adjusted R squared, the, the performance, right? The lowest AIC value is a really good, good indicator that we have a good model, right? And this, this, model has the lowest AIC value and it's significantly lower than the next best one, right? Because it's, it's lower than three. So that's a good way to compare between the models. In addition to that, we also think about which of these um, variables might have better implications for remediation. Is there one that we could do something about more than others, if that makes sense? You don't, you know, there's not a whole lot of, of things that we can do to make people I don't know, change their ethnicity. We are what we are, right? So there's really not much we can do in terms of remediation, but education, um, if it's a, you know, some sort of a health outcome variable, those are things we can actually do something about, right? So those are good ones to have in a model if, if, if you're choosing between um, several. And so now we have a passing model and it has population, jobs, low education, distance to urban center and businesses. So are we done? That's great. You have found a, um, a, pass, a model that passes all of the criteria for OLS, and we can use this model in powerful ways to make predictions. But actually, whenever we find a properly specified model, it's a good idea to take it the next step and run geographically weighted regression, especially since, if you notice, the Kernker test has a statistically significant result. The Kernker test, we didn't really talk much about here, is a test that tells you that the relationships that you're modeling, and this is very common with spatial data, are not consistent across the study area. Maybe the income variable is a really strong predictor in one area, but not such a great predictor in another area. Whenever we have this regional variation, it's not a bad thing. We have a properly specified model, and we actually automatically compute standard errors that are robust to that kind of regional variation. But it's, it's an indication that we might be able to improve our results, actually, by moving to a model that was designed specifically to allow those relationships to vary. So I think that the next thing that we should do is um, remember the AI. Somebody's going to remember the AICC 681, and somebody's going to remember the adjusted R squared, 83%. And now let's go ahead and go to um, GWR and see if we can improve and see if we can improve the results. And if we can, we'll want to map the coefficients from some of those variables, and so we can see the regional variation in those. When we have when we do see the regional variation in those variables, sometimes that can be really helpful for us if we want to try to design some remediation strategies. Okay. Well, I'm sure some of you were thinking, I can't believe she's telling us we have to find a whole new model in GWR, right? 
but the good thing is that we don't. That's why we did all this hard work in exploratory regression is so that we have this passing model that we can feel really confident about. It's passing all those assumptions. And now we can use the same model when we go to GWR. So population jobs, low education, distance to urban center, and number of businesses. I say that out loud so I will remember it when I get to GWR. So we get, we go to GWR, we choose our data, choose a dependent variable, which in this case is calls still, and then we choose those variables. So population, jobs, low education, distance to urban center, and businesses. And then fixed AIC is a good option. It's going to pick the best distance to use when it's creating those uh, neighborhoods and hit go. It's going to go through, first of all, we're going to get our... Um, our diagnostics, so we can see our adjusted R squared has gone up to 85% from 83.8. So it's gone up a bit, right? We've improved the model. We can also look at that AICC value, which was 681. Good. Now it's 678, so that's three. So it's a significant decrease, right? So we've lowered the AIC value, we've increased our R squared, we've improved the performance of our model. but. You guys know that that's not our favorite thing about GWR. Our favorite thing about GWR is that we can take a look at how those relationships vary. So if we open up our attribute table, we can see that we have a coefficient for every single one of those variables, for every single one of those features, right? And now we can go in and choose our jobs variable and look at is that right? Yes. And we can look at where that relationship is strongest. Or we can look at, let's say, um, education. So we can see if we wanted to focus our, our efforts on increasing education levels in the area, increasing policies that would help kids stay in school, for instance. These would be the areas that we would get the most bang for our buck. Of course, we would want to keep kids in school everywhere in our study area, but sometimes we really have to focus our limited resources. This is a great way to do that by understanding those relationships. We also just learn a lot, right? It's really interesting to see how those relationships change and what factors are more important in which areas. Or even if you, sorry? It, the, what we're doing is we're showing where that particular variable is the strongest predictor. You're right, that was for 911, but that particular variable is a stronger predictor in that area. So if we want to pr produce uh, policies or programs in areas that are going to have the biggest impact, we would at least start in those. Or if you go to the one on jobs, did you, oh, you have to redo it, sorry. For example, this might be where we want to implement some programs on the, in the jobs for job safety. You know, we might want to go to these places and help them start some programs on how to keep, keep things safe and avoid accidents. These are the place, not, this is not necessarily where we have the most jobs. This is the place where that particular... Or the most 911 calls. Or the most 911 calls. This is the place where that variable is the strongest predictor. So great. I think there was one more thing that our community was interested in. We've answered so many of their questions, and we're going to summarize that in just a minute. But there was one more thing that our community was interested in, and they said that they know that their population is going to be doubling over the next 10 years, and they're a little bit of concerned about how the increase in population is going to put a demand on the 911 emergency call. So can we use GWR to um, predict the num what the demand is going to look like with an increased number of people? It's very demanding, isn't she? <laughs> yes, she is. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> I guess it's easy enough. Actually, I'll just use the result I just used from the um, results window. Which? How many of you guys use the results window? I know. Do you not Seriously, love that? Seriously, if you Run don't use the results window, you should check it out. <laughs> it is so awesome. And I always check it so that it keeps my results forever. It does make your map documents pretty big, but then you can come back to an analysis you did six months ago and see exactly what you did, which I don't know about you, but I don't remember what I ate for lunch yesterday. <laughs> so it's just really awesome to have the results there and be able to rerun your analysis really quickly and just change one or two parameters. So 
if you're not using it, I highly recommend getting to know the results window. So we'll rerun the analysis still with population, jobs, low education, distance to urban center and businesses. But this time, instead of using um, the data we used originally, we're going to use a data set that actually has a prediction variable in it. And that is a future population variable where our population is increasing. And we want to see the impact that that population variable is going to have on the number of 911 calls. So we'll leave all of the other variables the same because we're still going to calibrate the model using those same variables. But now we're going to use that prediction ver data and we're going to use future population, then jobs, low education, distance to urban center, and businesses. And you'll notice I did those in the exact same order as I did them as they are here, and that's because they have to be in the same order. So you want population and future population to match up, and then each of those corresponding variables to match up so that it knows which one's related to which in the, in the model. So now we want to create our output prediction feature class. And we're ready to go. So the diagnostics are going to be exactly the same because we're still calibrating the model the same way, right? But the difference here is that now we've got this uh, prediction feature class. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to symbolize that the same way that we're symbolizing our 911 call data, except I'm going to use that predicted value. And we're going to go through, and we can see hopefully, if I did this right. The way the prediction compares. So we can see that this is what we have now. And if we, if the population, in, based on our population projections, this is the impact it's going to have. And we can see those areas where that impact is greatest. We can see the, the places where that change is going to happen. And it can help us prepare for how we, how we kind of plan in the future. So, great. And just a, I guess a little note because I do get asked every time that yeah. swipe, which is pretty awesome, right? There's an effects toolbar, and it has the swipe. So if you're interested in swipe, it's in the effects toolbar. Mm -hmm. It's a good one. So I think we're done, right? We are done. Let's summarize what <laughs> Lauren did here. Um, she used hotspot analysis so that the decision makers could evaluate how well the fire and police units were currently located in relation to the 911 call demand. And they could use that information to try to decide if they needed additional uh, locations or if they wanted to move some of the existing ones. Um, where those factors suggested, she used OLS to identify the key factors that contribute to 911 call volumes. And where those factors suggested remediation or policy changes, like with the education programs or the safety on the job programs, her GWR analysis of the coefficient values suggested where those projects and policies might be initially rolled out, where they might have their biggest impacts. And finally, while we didn't and finally, well, we didn't show it here. And finally, we could also use GWR to predict call volumes for the future. Um, this would not only help the community, this not only helps the community anticipate uh, what the 911 call demands are going to be in the future, but it also provides a yardstick for measuring how effective ultimately the remediation policies are. It's funny, she came in and she goes, I don't think we do the actual prediction. I went, oh, yeah, we do. <laughs> so she's going, okay, fine. <laughs> Apparently, we usually don't. Um, we, so we wanted to thank you for hearing this session. Um, we're going to have time to take lots of questions. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about these tools when you get home, we have a website, esriurl.com slash spatial stats. This has short videos. We're going to have a new hotspot tutorial. Up there by the end of the week, I promise. So if you have never done the hotspot analysis tutorial, wait. just wait. Wait till next week. Not so not Monday through Friday. Wait till the following Monday to download it. Yeah, yeah. Because we have it I, all ready. It's going to gonna be better. Final edits and it's on there. Yes. We also have if you are um, still at 10.0 and aren't going to go to 10.1 quickly, you want to use exploratory regression. Uh, this is also the place to download our, our sample script of exploratory regression. 
Um, and then we have tutorials. We put our email addresses here because we hope that you will consider us a resource. If you have questions, please contact us. It's, our managers always kind of cringe when we do this, but because you guys take us up on this. <laughs> but it's really, <laughs> it's really one of our favorite things to do is to help you be successful. Um, we ask that you please do go to the esri.com slash UC session surveys and provide us with feedback on how we can improve, how we can do this better.